Hi, I'm David Garrett. I'm a cellist with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and cello teacher at the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at California State University, Long Beach. In this video, I'm going to discuss and demonstrate cello passages for upcoming auditions for the California All-State and All-Southern Honors Orchestras. There's five passages, two passages from the second movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, a passage from the scherzo of Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream, and two passages from different movements of Brahms's Third Symphony. In addition to just our usual good cello playing as far as accuracy and beautiful tone, each one of these excerpts has special features that we need to give special attention to. And that's my purpose in this video, is to sort of highlight those important features for you. The first passage is from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, the second movement. This is the opening theme. <laughs> This melody is on virtually every professional cello audition, so uh, experienced cellists know it well, and it's good for you to have the opportunity to polish it up now. A basic uh, difficulty in this excerpt is that we have conflicting goals. We want to make a smooth and legato melody. At the same time, we have to pay great attention to the dotted rhythm. For example, it's a big mistake if your dotted rhythm rounds off and turns into triplets. Here's what it sounds like to me as triplets. That's really uh, almost a cardinal sin in playing this excerpt. It's important to get good dotted rhythms. It's a very good idea in your practicing to use your metronome to subdivide so that you're sure that you're playing accurate rhythms. So these accurate rhythms have a certain angular quality to them, but at the same time we want the melody to be very smooth and legato. <laughs> Speaking of rhythms, notice that there's a difference in measure uh, four and measure five. At the end of measure four, it's a 32nd note. Then at the end of measure five, it's a 16th note. That's a detail that is important to represent accurately. This excerpt's a little difficult because it's in the flat keys, so we have to make a lot of shifts and string crossings. We can't just play in first position and go across strings. So there's another conflict. We have lots of shifts and extensions for this flat key, but we need to create the impression of just smooth and ease in this melody. <laughs> It's also important to represent these dynamics well at the end. Notice that the forte on the high E flat is a subido forte. Be careful. Be careful not to crescendo to the forte. It's supposed to be a subido forte. Not a harsh accented forte, but nevertheless subido forte. 
you know, different editions have different dynamics after the forte. The music that's been distributed for you to prepare for these auditions has a diminuendo after the forte, and so we'll play that. But just as a point of information, many editions don't have the diminuendo after the forte. So the piano is a subito piano. But I think it's wise if we play the dynamics that are represented on the page. Now, we don't have to necessarily play all the bowings that are represented on the page. It's understood when you play the audition that you may do some different bowings or even different fingerings. For example, usually we take pickups on an up bow, but for this passage, we'll take the pickup on a down bow in the upper part of the bow. In, in the music that's been distributed, there's no staccato dot on the C. In some editions, there is a staccato dot. Even, there, even though there's no staccato dot on that C, let's lift gently after that downbeat C in the first measure. That's, that makes a nice phrasing. Uh, so in this passage, we need accurate rhythms, smooth legato, and, and a bit of phrasing. It's easy for auditions to feel like tests that we are trying to just avoid making mistakes on. And it's important to avoid making mistakes, but also be sure to create a nice melody. One way to make a nice melody in, in this Beethoven passage is go to the harmony changes, just like a good jazz player plays to the changes. We do that in this passage too. Listen to a recording and listen to where the bass notes change. They highlight the, the harmony changes, and our melody should flow and ebb to and from those harmony changes. This excerpt from the Beethoven Fifth Symphony continues with the first variation of the slow movement. Notice on the music you've been given, there's a double bar after where I just stopped. Uh, in context, the music doesn't continue directly to this next passage. There is a, a large part of the piece in between. They've just put the excerpts close to each other for convenience on the page. So definitely stop after that first theme that I just played. This first variation comes maybe a minute or two later in the piece. This first variation, I think, is simpler. It has fewer details we have to worry about than the theme. If we just play smoothly, legato, smooth shifts, smooth string crossings, then we accomplish our goals for this passage. <laughs> Again, let's observe the dynamics carefully as they're printed on the page. The forte is a subito forte. It's not loud in a harsh way, just a full, expansive sound. And then the piano in the next measure is subito piano. It's not prepared by a diminuendo as it was in the theme. Now here's a crescendo. Forte. Subodo piano. Just as in the theme, different editions have different dynamics, I think it's best to prepare the dynamics as they are indicated on the page that you've been given. In both the theme, <coughs> pardon me, in both the theme and the first variation, uh, notice that the dynamic is soft, it says piano dolce, and that's an important factor. We want to create a confident sound that has the impression of being full but it's really not very loud. So a gentle, smooth sound is what we're after in, in both the theme and the first variation of the Beethoven. The next excerpt in the list is the scherzo from 
Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream. <laughs> This is a fast excerpt that requires us to use a bouncing bow spiccato. Be patient in developing your spiccato. If it doesn't come naturally, allow yourself the opportunity to work it out gradually through slower tempos. This is the kind of bouncing bow though where if we can, we want to get we want to get a relatively high bounce. You know, sometimes when we bounce the bow on the cello, we get this bouncing effect, but the hair never actually leaves the string. However, for this Mendelssohn, we want to create such a light character that we will have the hair leave the string. Now, there's a few important little details for this one. In the first place, it's important to maintain a steady tempo. Be sure to practice with your metronome. You'll find that changing from 16th notes to 8th notes and then the quarter note will affect your tempo if you're not careful. Similarly, when we have dynamics, the hairpins that go up and down and then the crescendo at the very end, those can have an effect on our tempo. But we shouldn't allow that. We should maintain a perfectly steady tempo, a metronomic tempo, from beginning to end. Regarding our articulation, the 16th notes are naturally short because of how we bounce them. The 8th notes should be similarly short. We don't make the 8th notes longer. That, that doesn't suit the character of the piece. In fact, if you listen to a recording of this piece, you hear throughout in that mixture of sixteenths and eighth notes, notice that the eighth notes are just as short as the sixteenth notes. And so we'll maintain that same shortness of eighth notes when we play our excerpt. Now this accent on the uh, quarter note is important. Try to Try it, first of all, be sure that it's present. Do make a good accent. But it shouldn't be a heavy accent. It should be just a little stinger. The loud part of the accent should take a very short time. And then the rest of the quarter note is a soft, breathy sound. After you make this accent on the quarter note, you'll have to retake your bow to get back to a good bouncing spot for the following notes. Also important is, in this excerpt is do represent the hairpins up and down. They make a nice expressive gesture, but also make sure that after you make your hairpins up and down that you return to your soft level. It's easy to stay too loud after those hairpins. And this whole excerpt should be played in a piano dynamic up until the crescendo at the very end. passage carries on for just a few more measures, which they uh, clipped off, they truncated just to save space on the page, I believe. The final passages in our audition list come from Brahms' Third Symphony. The first passage is from the slow movement, where the cellos have the melody at the beginning of the movement. <laughs>
main goal in this excerpt is to play with a beautiful singing tone. But notice that it's not too loud. Mezza voce, Brahms tells us. Here's another passage, like the Beethoven Fifth Symphony passage that we already covered, in which we play the little pickup with a downbow. Make sure that your downbow isn't accented. Of course, the pickup is weaker than the downbeat. And so, as in the Beethoven, play the pickup downbow, but starting in the middle or upper part of the bow. That way you have the whole up bow for the long note that follows on the downbeat. Here again, play very expressively, represent the hairpins beautifully. And uh, notice in the second line that the high note is not the loudest point of the phrase. That the hairpin carries forward to the uh, D, that's the loud point of the phrase. Some cellists will shift back there. But I think this isn't a place for a big sliding shift, so I choose to cross strings. And then I carry on with the A string. And here's another passage where uh, you don't need to follow the bowings that are printed. Um, you, can, you can catch the bowings as I play them in the video. Uh, and you can play whatever bowings suit yourself best, but these are the bowings that I like. passage in our excerpt list is from the finale, the beginning of the finale of this same Brahms Third Symphony. top priority here is to maintain a very soft, uh, almost ghostly sort of dynamic and sound. Also a very smooth, gliding legato. The fingerings that are printed in this excerpt work pretty well, and most of the bowings do too, although as you can see there's a couple of things that I do differently. Even though we want to maintain a very soft sound, do observe and represent the dynamics. In the first four measures, there are no dynamics, and so we should maintain kind of a flat line sound. Try not to let string crossings or shifts put bumps in your legato, and uh, don't play expressively to the high part of the phrase. That's kind of tempting, but that's not what Brahms wants us to do. Now we have little inflections marked in our music. We have accents on the weak note, the eighth note that is the pickup. With diminuendos that make us fall further off our sound after the accent. So represent those well. The accents shouldn't be loud, but they should be present. Their accents within piano. And in these 16th note rippling passages that follow, uh, we want to have fleet fingers. If, if you think uh, their, your passage work isn't as clear as you want it to be, perhaps think of uh, playing a little more on fingertips. That helps clear up my passage work sometimes. If 
we maintain that arched athletic hand position, we have a good chance of being fast enough and, and clear in our execution. There's only the, the, the hairpins, the downward hairpins on the first two arpeggios. And we actually don't need to uh, overplay those dynamics. So we're already pianissimo, so we should be very soft. If you fall off much more, you may not be heard. You do have to play all the notes in this passage. Those are the five excerpts in California's all-state cello auditions and all-southern cello auditions for this 2012-2013 year. I hope this video has been helpful to you, and I wish you good luck with your auditions and with all things, musical and otherwise. Thank you.